Okay, uh, good afternoon everyone and welcome to the second webinar on this series from the Clare City project. Uh, the first webinar was uh, last week and that very much focused on the public engagement aspects of Clare City. Today we're going to zoom in or focus on the quantification aspects. Uh, the webinar will take about an hour and 15 minutes, give or take. Um, as Sophie mentioned, if you have any questions, please use them in the chat, punk, uh, chat box and then we'll pick them up as we work our way through. And if anything we don't get to during the webinar, we will provide as an FAQ at the end. So as I mentioned, today we're gonna to focus on the modeling or quantification aspects, not the whole modeling chain, but certain elements of it. Uh, we've got three speakers, uh, Chris Van Herl from Transport Mobility Leuven in Belgium, uh, Anne Kiel from the Technical University in Denmark, and Vera Rodriguez from the University of Aveiro in Portugal. In terms of the agenda, I'm going to give you a very quick five, 10 minute introduction to Clare City, just to give you a little bit of context to help you understand the concept of the project and also to help you understand how the quantification aspects fitted into the Clare City process. I'll then pass over to Chris, who will focus on uh, explaining the modeling chain and then uh, zooming in on the transport elements. And then we'll have a quick Q&A using the uh, questions that you send in. After that, we'll go over to Anne to talk about the residential energy use and over to Vera to talk about the air quality modeling. And we'll have another uh, Q&A session at the end. So the Clare City project, or citizen-led air pollution reduction in cities, uh, was a four-year Horizon 2020 funded project. And the idea behind it was to try and understand how people's day-to-day -day practices and day-to-day -day activities and behaviors uh, generated air pollution and carbon emissions. And what we really wanted to kind of dive into is an understanding of how uh, societal factors can influence the way we act and influence the way we behave and how they can put us into a if you like a cycle of entrenched uh, behaviors that people can often find quite difficult to get out of and those behaviors then result in the uh, generation of air pollution and the generation of carbon emissions and the subsequent public health impacts now we did this in uh, four cities and two regions around Europe, Bristol in the UK, Amsterdam in the Netherlands, Sosnowiec in Poland, Ljubljana in Slovenia, and then the Liguria region of Italy and the Aveiro region of Portugal. And the reason for that is that each one of these regions have different demographics, have different air quality and carbon challenges, have different capacities, capabilities, have different data sets. And what we wanted to do was test the uh, scientific robustness of the process we had developed and also test the um, flexibility within our processes and could we be uh, adaptable for different cities of different sizes, different capabilities uh, and different data sets. So the concept behind Clearsy was to try and move the conversation from where and what to a who and a why. And what we mean by that is when we think of traditional air quality and carbon management uh, policy making and indeed um, um, management processes, they tend to focus very much on these technocentric conversations. So when we talk about the what, we tend to talk about um, transport, industry, um, domestic energy use. Uh, and when we talk about the where, we tend to talk about these geographical locations where we might have exceedances of national air quality objectives or exceedances of European limit values. Now that conversation is fine for a, a, a management or a policy audience, but the public sometimes struggles uh, with that. So what we wanted to do was evolve the conversation to be more citizen friendly. And this is why we started to think about how we could think of air quality and carbon emissions in terms of who and why. So start to look at the, the challenge from the perspective of different demographics, whether it's gender, whether it's um, uh, age, whether it's economics, starting to think of it from uh, different um, practices or motives or behaviors. And what we mean is if you think about how you might apportion air pollution, we might traditionally apportion it by cars, buses, HGVs, or Euro standards, or petrol versus diesel. Well, we wanted to take it to a point where we were able to break it down by traveling to work, taking kids to school, leisure time, shopping. And it is these 
day-to-day behaviors that people, that citizens are experts in. It's these day-to-day behaviors that people can have a meaningful conversation with. And when you can make that uh, leap to connect people's behaviors to people's, um, or to the generation of pollution, then you can have a very, very different conversation with the public. And this is a kind of information we started to get to. On the left is a very traditional source of apportionment exercise that you might see. This example has come from Bristol, one of our case studies, where we see a breakdown of NOx emissions by different uh, vehicle types and indeed by different fuels. Whereas Clare City on the right was trying to then break this data down in terms of our baseline and also our future scenarios by things like shopping, leisure, commuting, business. And what you then get when you take that sort of data and marry it with the qualitative evidence that was generated, you can have a very different conversation. You can then start to understand why people feel entrenched in a certain pattern of behavior. You can then start to understand what are the innate mechanisms that might allow you to um, move away from that behavior so that uh, greener choices become the social norm for everybody. And when we talk to people, we start to see statements like, unfortunately, I use my, I use my car. Heavy loads, steep hills, small children, tired, I just want to get home, I use my car. I need flexibility to go where I want, when I want, I just want to get home, I use my car. Um, public transport, never getting better, I need to use my car. So it was these sort of factors that influence people's behavior. So marrying that uh, quantification data with this qualification evidence allow us to shift, the, we have a conversation with the public towards the causes of air quality. It also allowed us to shift, uh, to give uh, citizens a platform to voice their opinions on what they would like their future cities to look like and how they might shape those cities. So, as I mentioned, these enabling interventions start to put in place to allow them to move away from those entrenched behaviours. And today, as part of this, we will primarily focus on objective two, which is around the innovation elements in our quantification work packages. So this is the clear city process. It was uh, primarily divided up into three phases. Uh, the first phase was around establishing the baseline. Second phase was around citizen and stakeholder engagement and this co-creation process. And then the third phase was around developing policy packages for the cities going forward. So zooming in on that diagram, the top phase was about understanding and benchmarking people's behavior. We then had to kind of quantify that baseline to get an understanding of how people's behavior can generate pollution and also an assessment of the policy landscape so we understand how um, city, these cities are starting to function. We then took that evidence and we were able to get out into phase two, engage with the public and have very different conversations with them through a number of different public engagement activities like uh, online games, workshops, community events, schools competitions, apps, etc. And it was really about looking at a number of different engagement mechanisms that we might be able to, to have conversations with very, very different publics, different audiences, different backgrounds. And if you'd like to learn more about that specific element, you can look at a recording of an hour from last week. But it's really this left-hand side of the, pro of the process that's uh, started to generate co-creation of scenarios where we brought our citizens and our stakeholders together to start to try and reach consensus around what our future cities might look like. And through a suite of dialogue um, workshops and processes, we got to the point of where we were able to come up with a single unified policy scenario for our cities. And then that scenario was taken back into our quantification work package so that we could quantify it in terms of uh, changes in behavior and source apportionment, quantify for emissions, air quality, and all the way through to public health. So that is uh, the clear city process in, in five minutes or less. Um, I'm going to now pass over to Chris Van Harold from Transport Mobility Leuven. Chris was our quantification work package uh, with Miriam Lopez from the University of Elviro and also led on the transport elements. So I'll pass over to Chris to explain the modeling chain in more detail and then focus in on the transport. Chris, over to you, please. Uh, all right, thank you, Enda, for the introduction. Uh, good afternoon, also from my part in this uh, webinar for Clare City, focusing on the modeling. Uh, I think Enda, you did a nice job trying to capture and represent Clare City in, in, in brief, uh, in very short, with the core elements there. 
I'll now dive a bit into how modeling fits into this in, into, into the project. Uh, it, it's a bit different compared to classical air quality project, I would say. And even then, I think we still have time, only have time for just a few highlights and we'll, we'll zoom in on transport, domestic en en energy use, and we'll flag some examples. So um, first, how we see the modeling in Clare City, the, the assessment process basically. So you, you've seen this graph here on the right uh, that ended up produced, uh, ended up introduced as an explanation, overarching view of the project. So where does where this modeling uh, fits into this? Of course, the, the, the typical assessment process is that, that you have to verify uh, what the current situation is and how the, the future situation will be of air quality levels uh, in each of these case cities. So these are the first steps that we took. Our reference year was 2015 and we've taken uh, projection years 2025, 35 and 50 uh, as, as benchmarks for short term, medium term and long term. Uh, so the, it's important, of course, to without even starting to interact with the citizens to establish your business as usual scenario because also so uh, existing policies will have effect. And then the big bulk, of course, is the, is the last part, is the scenario assessment. And there has been a challenge, I think, for Clare City, for the modeling at least in Clare City, because it's a bit different compared to classical uh, air quality assessment projects. So what we first did, as Enda indicated, we've collected a lot of information from citizens themselves to establish uh, explorative scenarios, let's say, and, and tested these quantitatively also. This to learn on the expert side, but also to uh, to teach, let's say, to, to, to learn on the on the citizen side what kind of measures are effective and what not. So it's important that, to, that this feedback loop is included because you would see that sometimes you would pick or citizens would pick measures which are either ineffective or not targeting the right pollutant. Uh, so that's the first step. Then there's a feedback loop uh, which uh, leads to a final uh, policy workshop where and that leads then to a final uh, unified policy scenario. So if you see these abbreviations here coming further in the in the, in the webinar, then you know what these lead to. So the stakeholder dialogue workshops and there's are explorative. Uh, the policy workshop was the conclusion of this discussion and the unified policy scenario is the one that we've uh, we've produced fed in to the policy package. So that's the assessment process uh, that in terms of methodology, um, I'm assuming that we have a pretty strong uh, uh, I mean, audience with modeling experience, at or at least on the policy side. So this should not be uh, um, new to you. It's it, if you model air quality, there's a pretty classic sequential chain of of, uh, of um, um, yeah, efforts. So you first have to estimate the activity for transport, for example. This is vehicle kilometers. Trans uh, then uh, estimate from that the emissions, estimate from that the air quality, estimate from that the health impact. So it's a pretty straightforward sequential chain. Uh, well, it sounds easy if you say it, of course, but you, we all know the complexity, but uh, at least it's very sequential. We have tried to add an extra step uh, because of the Clare City focus on the citizens, uh, so the citizen behavior, uh, and we'll dive into that later. Uh, we've included carbon footprint also explicitly because there are measures which are uh, good for carbon, bad for uh, air quality, for example, biofuels. Uh, so that's something that we want to include as well. And we have a typically strong uh, modular approach. Yeah? So these are this is the modular approach that we've that we've maintained uh, and we'll zoom in on, on three elements here. Uh, so the, the first that we would like to zoom into is, is transport. That's the one that, that TML did uh, specifically. Um, there's various options which are possible to do transport traffic modeling or transport emission modeling. Uh, we've added two innovative elements, I think here, and that's the use of uh, uh, adding uh, travel survey data to the to the, um, to the apportionment section. And the second part is the um, the, the spatial allocation uh, in, in a different way with using open source tools. So that's what I'll dive into later on. Uh, we'll have a Q&A after that session, very brief to have any questions, but then the second part uh, and from DTU will take over uh, and we'll zoom a bit on the residential, the domestic energy uh, consumption and also what the underlying behaviors are that are driving this uh, uh, energy use. So, I mean, even up to the use of appliances, again, to understand uh, what kind of policies are, are, are effective. And finally, we'll give the word, like Anna said, to Vera, to just show a few of the examples, uh, I think we'll, we'll be zooming in on the Avero case uh, with some examples of the results of the whole chain. Let's say uh, what what policies has what policies have we been assessing and what are the results? What are the impacts and what are the learnings? 
So first of all, let's let's do let's do transport, and that's the one that uh, that that we've been working on for yet. Yeah, let's say the last uh, two, three, four years. Even uh, it's been a long project, and we're we're, we're coming to to an end. Um, there's two elements that we want to zoom in. Like I said, so uh, I think this one is the is, is quite interesting. Uh, if um, if you have uh, worked with transport modeling before, then I think this is something that we will like. So the first is the use of open source tools rather than complex tools. Uh, and the second one is the use of travel survey data. So uh, on the first one, um, so uh, it's hard to assess the audience here. So I'm going to assume some, uh, some, some knowledge on beforehand. So what we have used is uh, something called OpenStreetMaps. Um, that's an open, uh, open data set, uh, which basically looks like Google Maps, but it's all uh, open, uh, open accessible. Uh, it's collected and updated by voluntary contributors. So any participants, uh, any civilians who want to uh, start anything with, I don't know, road signs or something, you can upload it here. Uh, it has, over the past few years, it has become very complete, uh, and, and especially for, uh, for key parameters, so like road types, uh, road sections, uh, uh, even, um, well, the, let's say the small roads for, for pedestrians only, uh, have been included. Um, and that's something which is very valuable. Uh, t the completeness of that data set is, is, is of huge value. It's almost like Google Maps, only it's freely, uh, freely available and you can use. What's interesting of this aspect as well and then specifically from the perspective of uh, air quality modeling is the spatial accuracy so we've used this application so this approach uh, for four of the six cases that we've done so the in two cases we have used a transport model from the from the city themselves so that's bristol and amsterdam but the other cases did not have that and we could see that if you opt for this approach the open street map approach then actually the spatial allocation or the spatial representation of the network is much more accurate because you don't have this need for spatial accuracy and in tra in traffic models in traffic models you want to see if a, if a network is performing if, a, if an intersection is effective but not per se uh, the exact location of the traffic so we had quite some issues matching the that uh, in, in the right way. We did not have it with this approach. So that's a nice benefit. Uh, of course, what this approach does like, uh, OpenStreetMaps, is uh, transport data. So we still have to estimate, of course, transport data. But we have also used open data for, for that side. So um, open transport map is one existing initiative, but we have not used that because it was not complete. So we started to estimate our transport demand uh, ourselves. And we're using, uh, again, uh, open data, open land use data from uh, OpenStreetMap uh, directly. But uh, for the case for Clare City, we have basically used uh, Urban Atlas. So that, that means it can uh, estimate the travel generation based on the land use of, uh, of a specific domain. Uh, and we use that basically to generate transport demand. After that, it's fairly simple. Uh, again, it's very easy to say this, of course, but there is uh, quite some straightforward steps. So model split uh, is something that you can use at city level. There are plenty of survey data, and most often the city themselves know quite well what the model splits are. So you can just apply that. And then the third part is the network assignment. So again, also here we use open source uh, algorithms uh, for the people who are knowledgeable in traffic modeling, we, we use the Dijkstra shortest path algorithm. Uh, and because computation power has improved and uh, these, um, if you use simplified algorithms, then you can, I mean, it can perform pretty well and you can do uh, quite some quite good uh, network assignment. I'll give you just an example of, of uh, an illustrative example uh, for, uh, for the Morandi Bridge. So Liguria was one of our cases so in Genoa and well almost in the middle I think of our project the, the bridge collapsed there so uh, as a test case we just saw what, what how the traffic would respond if you if you would take away the bridge. So this is the estimated traffic demand uh, in the Liguria region uh, the bridge is here you can see a I will not dive into the scales, it's just illustrative. So the red ones are very congested, a lot of traffic, green, less traffic. And you can see if you take away the bridge, this is the effect, highlighted a few examples of, uh, of the effect. But if we, if we toggle to uh, non-bridge intact, bridge not intact, bridge intact, bridge not intact, you can see how the traffic uh, behaves. This is basically, this is an illustrative example. Huh? So we've uh, this was uh, just to show uh, that uh, with a, Quite simple modeling effort. You can you can capture these effects, which are uh, sufficiently correct for uh, for emission estimates. So what's happening next? Uh, you have um, a post-processing step. 
here we have a flexibility that you can uh, scale basically the estimates of your of, of the first two steps with uh, traffic counting data if they are available like I said we've used this for four cases and the level of data was different for these four cases so sometimes we could uh, calibrate well in other cases there was no data so you have to uh, um, um, just stick with your first shot our uh, profiles are also typically there so that's not uh, not that difficult to add this level of detail and finally uh, maybe I disappoint a few of the audience but we have just used existing uh, emission factors, of course, taking into account country-specific fleet composition. So if there's all of diesel, gasoline, and we've taken as an account, but we've not as established our own new emission factors. Um, so this basically concludes the first element of the transport that I would like to uh, to share with you. So it's a, it's a highly flexible approach. Uh, so you can actually use this in areas with a lot of data availability. Then you can calibrate much better. But you can also use it in in in, data, in areas with which are data poor, which was very useful for our case in Sosnobis, for example. We did not have uh, data to calibrate. Um, so. The second part is interesting as well from uh, an air quality perspective. You also have emission as line sources also on the smallest roads. So that's if you use traffic models, this is different because they are mainly the, the main roads only. I highlighted this uh, the, the advantage of the spatial mismatch. Um, and the fourth one is interesting. So it's a generic approach and open source in nature. So it's very easy to replicate this to other cities and regions. In fact, we have already done this uh, in Belgium for uh, for another case. So the second element of so if you have questions, then I think we dive after the sec uh, section for uh, for a short Q and A. I'll first present the second one on the transport and its use of of travel survey data. Um, so again, uh, as in and indicated in the introduction, if we think about air quality and sources, we we typically stop or start with transport, let's say, and, and then activity or vehicle kilometer is the indicator. But we want to add uh, the, 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 the original dimension, the original reason what's driving this demand into this uh, equation. Uh, and why do we want this? Because we think uh, that if you want policy, uh, assessment to see what, what the policy assessment really does, um, you need to account for behavior. For example, if you have a policy on telework, uh, it will target commuting traffic. It will not per se target blindly all, all uh, reasons for traffic. So what we did is we used uh, national travel survey data. It's an extensive database of travel patterns, maybe not known per se for uh, air quality models, but of course we as transport, uh, 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 transport research practitioners, we know about this. We've used this uh, and it's semi-standardized. So there is in all countries, there's, there is this type of data. We've applied it for the UK and for um, uh, the Netherlands, the Amsterdam case. Um, of course, here the challenge is the, the, the mismatch. Uh, you have to link the activity data that we modeled uh, before, either from the traffic model or our own assessment uh, with these uh, travel survey data. And that's a challenge. Uh, I, will, <laughs> I will spare you the details. Um, but of course, I mean, it's, it's still very, very interesting. So, uh, and we've seen that it is, has been of great value in, in terms of communication and awareness creation throughout the project. So a few examples here uh, on the left hand side here, you can see the, the share of um, the, the, tra the traffic. I think it's NOx emissions in this case uh, by mode uh, and also by motive. And then you would maybe be surprised that it's actually leisure, which is the which is actually dominant. It's not per se commuting. Uh, if you dive into the right, and that's uh, I think this is a weekday in the morning peak. Uh, then of course uh, commuting is starting to become dominate dominating. Uh, but also uh, I think other public transport and so on are, are a bit more important here. So just to show uh, the potential of this uh, uh, of this um, uh, well addition here with these with these donuts, you can see the the different. Uh, uh, of traffic of modes chosen by uh, socioeconomic profiles. The bottom ones are income uh, prof, uh, income uh, uh, groups and the top ones are car ownership levels. So the outer one here is, are the households with two cars, the inner one with zero cars. Obviously these uh, have to rely more on public transport and active travel. Um, if, you see, if you look at uh, um, the income group, so at the bottom, the outer line here is the, the wealthier income group and the inner one is the less wealthy income, the the few, the, the, the poorest income group, let's say. And you can still see that car is dominant in all three. Uh, this might be counterintuitive, but it's definitely the case. So also the, the lower income groups actually use a lot of, uh, a lot of cars. So zooming up and, and concluding maybe on this, on this uh, second element of the transport uh, modeling is there's, there's, Big value in this because you can do you can do better better impact assessment. See, so especially if they target specific behaviors of uh, of uh, of citizens, and we have found throughout the project that this has been of great value for awareness creation among citizens who 
most often, like most of us think that commuting is the problem in terms of air quality. Well, if you look at just pure at the share of emissions, it's not per se the case. Uh, there is, of course, uh, some big limitations that with this process we have now, uh, for example, perceived this as a post-processing approach, uh, and then you miss some spatial, uh, particularly spatial distribution of the emissions. If you, have, for example, have uh, shopping hotspots, uh, then the dominant uh, dominance of the uh, shopping motive will be will be bigger. Uh, but there is definitely potential to fully integrate this in the demand generation as well. So that's something that we're uh, we're looking into. So I think that's it from the transport side. I think we have now, uh, well, I think some 10 minutes, five to 10 minutes for, for Q&A. Um, I would say if anything, if there are any questions on the classic in general or specifically transport, uh, well, happy to, happy to answer. Sophie? Uh Okay, oh, yeah, uh, sorry. Yeah, me. thanks, Chris. Um, so again, just to remind everyone that the presentations and recording will be available after the webinar. And uh, also to say that kind of the project is obviously committed to the principles of open access. So a lot of the relevant data sets and a lot of the relevant methodologies that we'll be discussing today will be available in the coming weeks on our, our community page on the uh, Zenodo archive. So if you want to do a deep dive into the data, that's possible. Um, in terms of uh, the chat function or the questions, it's been pretty quiet there. So if there are any questions, please send them through. But I suppose one of the common questions, Chris, that we've been asked over the last few years is about the rep replicability of the methodology in other cities. And in particular, I'm thinking about tools like OpenStreetMap and how they might work not just in any your EU city, but internationally. We do have a lot of international people on the call. Yeah. yeah, that's a good point. Uh, so um, uh, just as, as a general note, what, what we try to aim with uh, with this uh, exercise with using OpenStreetMaps is to to generalize for the six cases that we've done and in the, in, in the longer term post project to have a methodology that's easily applicable for, uh, for any city elsewhere, uh, wherever in Europe, actually the world. So first of all, OpenStreetMaps is complete globally. Uh, so, I mean, I think there, there are very few areas where the, the network data of open is not complete. Uh, the additional benefit, by the way, I forgot to say is that if there's any changes to the network, it's being updated almost instantaneously. So these contributors are very serious. So that's that's a very big plus. You can actually apply this. Uh, and yeah, I hope I was clear in, in the in the presentation that it's, it's hugely flexible in terms of data availability. So the, the demand generation can you come from different sources, from different land use data, but even if there is already some kind of origin destination matrix available from, I don't know what source, another transport model, we can just load this in. Uh, the assignment uh, algorithm we use, which is open, uh, well, it's just generic. I mean, the assignment is the same, let's say globally. Um, and yeah, I mean, th those are the key elements. So emission factors, again, these are also commonly available and we can scale uh, the, the calibration step. So, for my part, in different levels of complexity, this can be applied from uh, small cities to, to big cities globally. Um, next kind of suite of questions, if you like, because they're all interconnected, is around um, uh, the kind of assumptions and uncertainties within the data, uh, particularly when you're starting to try and uh, model policy changes. Um, and also thinking about where there might be data gaps. So I suppose this kind of reflects on what we've learned uh, across Clare City, where we had some very, very data-rich cities and some data-poor cities, how did we how did we adapt uh, in terms of thinking about those data gaps? Is there any practical tips that you might put forward? Uh, that's a good uh, that's a good question. Um, oh. Uh, of course, I mean, you, you've got a typical data uncertainty on the emission side, let's say, but uh, I think we can make abstraction of that. That's apply, that applies everywhere. Um, so, yeah, the, the big challenge, for example, if you compare Amsterdam with Sosnovich, so two of our cases, um, um, with Amsterdam, it's easy because they have their own traffic model, so you can just use that, but it's not per se better because of the spatial issue there. So a, big, a lot of data is not per se better for in some cases. And then if you look at Sosnovich, there was virtually no data, but yeah, in terms of data gaps, they started with a huge data gap, they had nothing. Uh, so um, what we added was at least a, a, a big first estimate. Uh, and even if you have limited validation data, let's say on the high level road network, it can already do a lot. Uh, and of course, we still have the verification step of the of the top down. Uh, so if you look, if you compare to emission inventories, it always, always gives you a, a good assessment. So uh, yeah, there, 
there's different levels of, of um, validation that you can apply. Um, and I think you have to see it in the scope of the of the case at hand. And do you want to have a detailed impact assessment or do you want a quick scan? Uh, I think actually the approach is suitable for both, but it really depends on, on the question at hand. Okay, uh, another question, uh, you mentioned kind of open source tools which are available. Um, do you see opportunities to contribute to uh, open source initiatives for climate data? particularly the important role that transport would play in terms of the climate argument. Well, yeah, sure. I mean, basically you have to adapt, uh, you have to add the emission factor CO2. <laughs> or, or, well, I mean, we, of course we did. So you, you can use this, uh, but I think if you're looking at climate, of course, you have to make sure that you're in line with uh, with, with the top-down inventories as well. Eh? So um, and there, there are other uh, in, uh, inventories which are useful, uh, like, like fuel-based or bunker-based uh, uh, emission inventories. Uh, but still, I mean, if you want to look specifically on spatial allocation of the sources uh, or the motivation or the reasons uh, why, why these emissions occur, then an approach like this is very useful. Eh? To, to target policy, let's say, not to make an assessment of the, of the total emission, but what the policy could, uh, uh, what, what the effect of policy measures could be reducing carbon emissions. Uh, and a, a final question before we move on, and as I mentioned, we'll cover everything that comes in in an FAQ at the end. But I suppose this question is really about the scalability of our approach. So we looked at uh, cities and we looked at uh, kind of wider uh, regional issues. And it's wondering about the applicability at a larger scale and particularly thinking about kind of urban versus rural and how we mm. might be able to use it there. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, actually, we, we encountered the limitations of this approach in the Aveiro region. Uh, so uh, a bit technical now, but if you uh, if you have a big network, the, the type of combinations from a shorter spot algorithm, they, they explode exponentially. Uh, so if you increase your, uh, your the size of your domain, uh, also the computational effort increases substantially. Uh, so what we did is we just broke this down in different sections, and then you can do it sequentially. You have to be, aware, be careful about the interconnectivity of these, but I think these, if you get, if you pick your domains uh, wisely, then this is something that you can solve. So in principle, it's scalable, uh, but uh, yeah, there, there is some caution needed to make sure that your domain of a single shot effort is uh, sufficiently small. For Liguria, it worked, to, to give an illustrative example. For Avera, the full region, we had to do it in two goes. Uh, okay, thanks, Chris. A uh, little bit of conscious of time, so uh, we're going to move on. Any questions that we missed, we'll pick them up at the FAQ at the end and um, uh, share it when we share the video and everything else. So thank you, Chris. Um, next, we have uh, Anne Kiel from the Technical University of Denmark, and we're going to move from some of the transport elements to thinking about the uh, residential energy use and how we can start people to see people in that data. So over to you, Anne, please. Thank you, Enda. So as mentioned, this is an integrated model. We just have Chris talk about the transport sector. Now we move into temporal distribution, specifically on residential energy use. So I'm Angreina Kewo, simply call me and I'm a PhD student at BTU. Together with Per Sivert Nielsen, who leads our team at DTU, at once my supervisor, and Shivang, who contributes in some parts. I will present our work modeling residential energy load profile at the city or region level using weighted proportion model. So our work has uh, four phases, uh, data collection where we gather some local climate data sets and population statistic, and then data pre-processing phase to ensure that our data sets are ready for modeling purpose. Furthermore, um, we apply the weighted proportion model in data modeling. And lastly, we provided the load profile analysis based on time chain. So um, yes, weighting model. Um, weighting model is widely used in the statistical research. In this case, it is a simplified approach where we match proportionally the city's profile with the household's profiles generated in profile generator. And to simplify and prevent the burden of seemingly endless modeling, the model consists of a limited input as these main characteristics, which are the citizen age group, labor force composition, and gender structure. So our work is a combination of the of a top-down approach 
with city's main characteristics and a bottom-up load model at the household level that has covered the detail, disaggregated input data in relation with behavior, occupancy, and time use appliances. And furthermore, Furthermore, uh, we selected the NOAS model or load profile generator and ALPG uh, artificial load profile generator developed by TU Tenter, the, Nether the Netherlands. Of course, there are some yeah. other cool load models. In fact, the main reason we selected these models because both models are developed based on behavioral model. NOAS model is uh, more detailed based on person design and uh, Twenta model, uh, Twenta's model is simpler, which creates uh, consistent profiles. So, um, as a result of uh, the WebPro model, first we identify these three main characteristics of uh, cities. And in this case, I, I take Amsterdam as an example. Then we're ready to match these cities' profiles with the household profiles proportionally. So, first we have to define the amount of the household's occupants to be modeled. Therefore, we apply a capacity model based on the weighted values and we got 10 occupants to be modeled. Then to determine the occupant, occupants in the labor force and gender, we apply the max mean uh, fairness of allocation. Therefore, uh, we got the amount of the gender in each age group, which is uh, in total fulfill the capacity. So um, these are the closest profiles that reflect the city's proportion in NOAS, uh, above in no is NOAS model and below is uh, the Tentas model. The underlying entities here indicate the age groups and the blue italic entities represent the labor force and the characters here represent the gender. And for Twentas model is simpler as it has a consistent predefined profiles. So as an overview, um, you can see here, oh, you can see this is the uh, uh, example of activity frequency per minute of profile single with work. It is uh, generated in load profile generator or NOAS model. And as a result for seasonal share, it indicates the common result with related works as winter is recorded as the highest and uh, summer is the lowest consumption share. And for the hourly, hourly average analysis, the generated load profiles identify the common peak demands of morning and evening peak where we can base have um, Weekend days have some specific characteristics, include the shifting hour of peak demand. And furthermore, the challenge during during this work, first, uh, it is difficult to collect some high resolution data in certain case studies. Second, we found missing values, um, outlier and different format or data structure of our raw data sets which are not compatible, therefore the pre-processing tasks are required and it can be a time-consuming process. Then our main limitation is the validation with the mature uh, city representative data because the mature, city, uh, mature data at the city level are only unavailable due to privacy issues, cost and size of the city's residential data. It is easier to obtain the mature data of some households or at the neighborhood level than at the city level. Second, um, our model depends on the external household profile generators since we are not building our own household simulators. So as conclusions, we have developed a simple and practical approach to model residential energy load profiles and this, uh, the results between cities profile with the selected predefined household profiles are proportionally matched, which may re represent the local characteristic through the load profiles that we generated. And this model is found to be more efficient in computational process of the residential sector uh, load profiles, given the number of households in the city that can represent the local profiles. Um, as recommendation, you can do our work in different approach. 
you can extend it in uh, spatial temporal analysis or you can make your uh, work based on stochastics model or you can go into machine learning di direction and it is also highly recommended if you do uh, our approach to use a specific profile generator or simulator developed in the case studies country for instance if we want to model a city in ne netherlands i think it's better to use the model developed by tu20 because it is developed specifically with dutch dwelling setting that's all from me thank you for your time okay thank you very much Anne. we'll take questions uh, at the end after vera has spoken so for now uh, you can switch off and we will move on to uh, vera rodriguez from the university of aviro uh, who's going to focus on uh, the air quality and health work vera over to you please thanks Sandra, for the introduction uh, good afternoon everyone i'll zoom now in the clear city molding outcomes focusing on the air quality results produced by the university of aveiro and the health impact assessment performed by the norwegian institute for air research um, in clear city the air quality assessment was first performed at mesoscale using the worth comex molding system uh, after that, the second generation Gaussian model uh, Urber developed at University of Aveiro was set up and run at urban scale over the urban area of each city and region. These simulations of NO2, PM10 and PM2.5 concentrations were performed using the emission rates available on the Clare City Emission Database for the selected emission sectors. A preliminary comparison of the urbair outputs with observations pointed out an underestimation of the simulated concentrations for all the case studies, mainly associated with the transboundary contribution. And therefore, a procedure was defined to account for the background concentrations and other remaining sources. The simulation results, together with this added background, were then calibrated against the measurements available for each pollutant through an adjustment procedure. Uh, this consists of a linear regression between the measurements and the simulated concentrations and thus the availability of measurements and the number of monitoring stations will strongly influence the accuracy of, the, uh, of this procedure. The Gaussian model outputs were also used to perform a source apportionment analysis and the simulations of the future scenarios were performed through a weighting approach. The population potentially exposed to harmful concentration levels was also estimated considering the U annual limit values as well as the WHO stricter guideline values. And finally, we have performed an health impact assessment study estimating mortality health outcomes and years of life loss due to exposure to air pollution in a given population. Let's recall on the assessment process. We have assessed emissions, air quality, and health impacts for the baseline in 2015. And we have refined and re validated our methodologies. Then uh, we have assessed the impacts of the business as usual scenarios, considering the time windows 2025, 2035, and 2050. After that, we have moved forward to assess the impacts of citizens-led scenarios, uh, starting with the scenarios from the stakeholders' dialogue workshops, and finally, um, we have assessed the impacts of the unified policy scenario, which came up from the policy workshop. As an example, I will now explore some results for the Aveiro region. Following citizens' engagements, the top 10 policies were presented to regional policymakers for their rep uh, reflections on implementation. This process led to a single unified policy scenario for the region. And this scenario consists of nine policies with a focus on road transport sector and the remaining policy with a focus on the industrial sector, with a similar ambition to the business as usual targets. In this unified scenario, there is a huge demand for public transport and active travel in the short-term future. Our region citizens are using mobility-related policies, including the reduction in a private car use. For public transport, citizens demand more ambition and speed in policy implementation. 
Unified scenarios policies focus on the fares, coverage, and frequency and travel times. The main barrier for the use of public transport in the region is the convenience cars offer. Uh, co uh, coverage, frequency and travel times of public transport are considered rather poor at the moment and therefore a, a disadvantage in comparison to the comfort that cars offer. In addition, parking is also easy and often free in the region. The main barriers for a model shift uh, from private cars to active, uh, active travel is the poorly developed cycling infrastructure in urban areas as well as the need for new and improved pedestrian routes. Therefore, there is a need to facilitate cycling through developing an urban bike network and further promote walking. There is also a need to intensify cooperation with employers to minimize car use through work from home policies. And although residential heating is a main source of PM emissions, this is not perceived an, uh, as an air pollution source by citizens. The, the fact that citizens have not come up with one single energy heating measure is an indication either of lack of knowledge or lack of empowerment. It should be noted that there are some citizens who are in favor of who drop pellets, for they consider this uh, an environmental or renewable heat source and many citizens are unaware they are a significant source of air pollution. All these policies are part of the Clare City Action Plan for the Albert region, which is available on the Clare City website. As a first step of the assessment process, the emissions were estimated for the baseline for all the emission sectors of each case study. In our region, we have considered the emissions from road transport, residential and commercial and industrial sectors. We have estimated NOx and PM emissions. And in particular case of PM, we have also estimated PM10 and PM2.5 emission ratios. In 2015, the road transport accounted for 49% uh, of the total NOx emissions. The industrial sector accounted for 45% of the total NOx emissions and the remaining 6% came from the residential and commercial sector. While wood burning for residential heating accounted for 28% of the total PM emissions and the industrial sector accounted for 70% of the total PM. The road traffic accounts with only 1% of these total annual PM emissions. We have then moved forward to the estimation of the emission reductions for each sector and each pollutant. Now, in this bar plot, we have excluded the reductions from the industrial sector, which were set to 40% already in 25 in the business as usual and in unified scenarios. In terms of NOx emissions, the main reductions were estimated in the road transport sector. Uh, where we have a reduction from 86% in 2015, the baseline, to less than 10% in 2050. For PM emissions, the main reductions are estimated uh, to happen in the residential sector, namely focusing on the wood burning practices, with a reduction of 60% already in 2025 compared to the baseline. These reductions are the same in the business as usual scenario as in the unified scenario, since this uh, did not include any measure related with this sector. And the same emission reductions are projected in 2025, 2035 and 2050 in this sector. The less ambitious reduction of PM emissions uh, will directly influence the lower reductions of PM concentrations when compared to NO2 concentrations. As an example, we plot here the NOx emissions from the road transport for the baseline over the Ave region. In 2015, the hotspots of NOx emissions were mainly located over the main highways and national roads crossing the region for the locals, the A25, the A29 and the A1. Here you can see now 
the differences of emissions in the unified scenario when compared to the baseline, pointing out the reduction of NOx emissions achieved with implementation of the unified scenario in the particular case of the road traffic emissions. The biggest reductions are achieved over the main highways and national roads crossing the region, the same locations where we have estimated the highest emissions in the baseline. We estimated the maximum reduction of NOx emissions of 6 megagram per year in 2025, 8.5 in 2035 and 9 in 2050, while over the entire domain these maps indicate slight uh, average reductions. With all the emissions estimated and also the meteorological data from the WARF model, we have run all the air quality simulations at urban scale with this Gaussian model. We have added the background concentrations and applied the adjustment procedure. For the average region outputs, we have obtained an adjustment factor of 2.2 for the annual two concentrations. We have compared the simulation results with observations available within the area. Uh, we have only uh, three air quality stations available measuring annual two concentrations and you can see in the figure the location of the three monitoring stations. We have uh, one industrial station that have recently been reclassified to suburban background station, a urban traffic station and a suburban traffic uh, suburban background station. Sorry. In this map, the NO2 concentrations are plotted for the baseline using as color scale the upper and the lower assessment thresholds from the EC Air Quality Directive. As you can see already in the baseline, there are only a few exceedances to the EU annual legal limit value, which is exceeded in 15 grid cells. In this table, we compare the observations with the um, simulated concentrations and we conclude an overestimation of the simulation in the industrial station, while on the traffic and uh, suburban uh, stations, there is an underestimation of the simulated annual two concentrations. We have also performed the source, uh, source apportionment analysis for the grid cells corresponding to the location of the monitoring stations. And you can see that for all the three stations, the road traffic is the main contributor to the simulated annual two concentrations with minor contributions from the residential sector. Here we have the annual two concentrations for the baseline. The simulation results indicate a maximum concentration of 58 micrograms per cubic meter. And with all the air quality modeling setup refined and calibrated for the baseline, we move forward to the simulation of the impacts on the air quality of all the scenarios. And now we show the annual two reductions achieved with the implementation of the unified scenario compared to the total annual two concentrations in the baseline plot in the previous map. We have simulated a maximum reduction of 30. Uh, 33 micrograms per cubic meter in 2025, around 47 in 2035, and 52 micrograms per cubic meter in 2050. And while over the entire area, in average, we have simulated reductions of around 6, 7, and 8 micrograms per cubic meter. Now we show also an example of PM2.5 concentrations for the Abbey region and for the baseline. The simulation results indicate a maximum concentration of 12 micrograms per cubic meter simulated nearby the location of an industrial point source. The industrial sector has a contribution of 88% uh, at this grid cell. And now the reductions are shipped with implementation of the unified scenario compared to the total PM2.5 concentrations in the baseline. We have simulated a maximum reductions of um, 1.3 micrograms per cubic meter in 2025 and 1.4 in 2035 and in 2050. While in average over the entire domain we have simulated insignificant reductions. Since the unified scenario is mostly focused on the road transport emissions, we have concluded a much more reduced impact of the scenarios on PM concentrations when compared to the NU2 concentrations.
We have also estimated the population of Sabay region potentially exposed to NO2, PM10 and PM2.5 concentrations. We have concluded that the population within the region is not at risk to be exposed to NO2 concentrations already in 2025 with implementation of the business as usual scenario. There is no risk of exposure to the EU annual limit values for PM10 and PM2.5 concentrations already in the baseline. However, Claire City modeling shows that 49% of the population in the region was potentially exposed in 2015 to PM2.5 concentrations above the stricter guidelines from the World Health Organization. And this figure shows that in 2050, with implementation of the unified scenario, 1.5% of the population in the region will still be exposed to PM2.5 concentrations above the WHO guidelines. For the six Clare City pilots, we have concluded that air quality will distinctly improve in the future depending on the levels of ambition citizens have set to the scenarios. We have estimated the health outcomes related with the population exposure to PM2.5, PM10 and NO2 concentrations in 2015, considering the number of premature deaths and the years of life lost. And we can see that PM2.5 is the most critical uh, pollutant, leading to the highest numbers of premature deaths and years of life lost. The benefits from implementing these emission control measures will be a reduction in the number of premature deaths linked with the exposure to NO2 concentrations of 10% further with the unified scenario compared to the business as usual, while the premature deaths linked with the exposure to PM10 and PM2.5 will be reduced by 2% and 1% uh, with the unified scenario. These limited health benefits with, uh, associated with the exposure to PM10 concentrations are mainly due to the low emission reductions we have identified in these bar plots. And now concluding, these results denote the importance of planning emission control measures considering their impacts on air quality and their health benefits. And these results also denote the relevance of informing citizens of the impact on air quality and health of their, of their chosen policies and measures. And that's all from my side. Thanks for your attention. Okay, right. before we go on to a, an FAQ, I'm going to give it back to Chris to just close out on some of the data sets that we've made available or we will be making available for others. Chris? Yeah, this, uh, this is a concluding slide indeed before we go to Q&A. So we just want to flag that uh, this generic city model, uh, which includes the components that we've presented in this presentation, will be available uh, from, from the project uh, Zenodo website. So you we established the generic city model, let's say, the model framework like we've presented. Uh, and there's another link will be coming soon as soon as our, uh, uh, yeah, the levels are, are completely accepted by the commission. So, uh, like I said in the beginning, you can pick and choose separate uh, components. For example, you could uh, use the, the, um, the residential model that Anne explained, or you could just use the air quality assessment side, uh, the health assessment side, or uh, the, the one I introduced, uh, the, um, the transport side if you want to pick and choose one of these. Uh, and we think this is especially interesting for medium-sized cities who don't have their own uh, assessment uh, uh, well, toolkit available uh, and still want to do some uh, well specific assessment for their city, uh, not per se only in Europe, but also globally. I want to add that we also have a database uh, with some interesting data. For example, I think emission factor and fleet composition are included there, and there are also some data on uh, which are relevant for case uh, city specific for the domestic energy use. Like I said, coming soon, um, and it will be on our uh, Zenola page. That was all from, from my side, and back to you. Okay, thank you, Chris. Um, so we've got uh, time again. We've got about mm, 10 minutes-ish uh, for some more questions. Um, so the first one is for Anne. And again, it's a similar question to what we had for Chris a little bit earlier in terms of the replicability, I don't like the word, but replicability of the methodology in cities outside Europe, thinking about perhaps on, in small island nations, so uh, how it can be adapted for other cities and other regions globally. And also a question in terms of your focus is very much on, on electricity. But could some of your methodology be adapted for other energies in the 
in the residential sector, so thinking about gas and solid fuel use. So over to Anne. Yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you for the nice, nice question. I think I have uh, answered the first one, and uh, it is so. My method is replicability uh, for uh, other local level or other regions. So specifically for Indonesia, um, the as I mentioned the main challenge during my work is uh, for high resolution data, but I think it's it doesn't exist for Indonesia because I have tried the climate data sets provided in the material in the BM, BMKG office, and uh, they have the higher uh, they have the high res resolution data and they provide it um, all over Indonesia. So I I don't think it's a it's a problem, and you just need to have your um, uh, city's main characteristic which are uh, uh, gender structure uh, age group and and labor force composition to to represent your uh, city's profile and yeah for the next gen, yes uh, we actually provide also for the gas which is uh, which are dominant uh, especially in europe and you can see um the space heating and uh, we also cover that low profile for the space heating and um domestic uh, hot water so um and we also try to uh, first thing we also try to explore the what's covered in the profile generator uh, are they cover the electricity are they cover the also the um gas uh, load profile and fortunately they cover that so uh, we also have the load profile for uh, gas uh, energy thank you okay uh, thank you Anne uh, I'm going to pick up on an earlier question which was asked when when Chris was speaking but I'm going to try and answer it um, because uh, so the question is really about uh, the assumptions that go tr into the interventions that we might try and model and I think Vera kind of in one of our early slides show the type of assumptions that we make in terms of ambition and in terms of uh, the timeline that, that these things get put in place. But in terms of the broader Clare City process, uh, through the co-creation process, we get to a point working with citizens where we understand the interventions that we want to put in place. And then we bring the policymakers into the discussion to put a level of ambition on those particular interventions. So it might be a percentage shift in modal, in modal choice. It might be uh, when an intervention would start and when it would mature in a city or in a, in a particular region. And through that kind of continual process of engagement with the policymakers, we start to refine those assumptions and come to a point that we collectively agree on what we what we want to do. But one of the key issues here is about transparency. So any assumptions, any uncertainties within the modeling processes are then described in our quantification packages and are then described in our in our policy outputs. So everyone understood the decisions we made and how we got to that point. So that's how we get our our our, um, our interventions to a point that they're they're model ready. Uh, next question is for Vera, and we're going to talk about building your urban air model. And it was really about how you put the sources into the model. Do you, um, for example, with residential emissions, do they go in as an area source into your model? So, Vera? Yeah, exactly. We have considered the residential emissions as area uh, emission sources, while for transport, for instance, we consider these as uh, line emissions. And uh, for industrial, we have split the, um, the emissions depending on the, um, the emission rate. So the large point sources was considered as uh, point emissions and um, the lower industrial uh, emission sources were considered as area, also as area emissions. Okay, uh, thank you, Vera. One more question for you, or maybe two more questions for you. Uh, one is around um, uh, the uh, verification and adjustment process of your models. Um, and it was really about any tips that you might have for other cities or other regions that are struggling to adjust their model simulations when uh, there isn't a suitable measured or uh, monitoring data in the region. Any tips you might have there? 
Okay, so we have considered um, this adjustment procedure uh, for each case study. So we have experienced really different realities. For Bristol, we had a lot of data for the, the NO2 concentrations. And for Amsterdam, we have a lot of monitoring it, monitoring data for all the, the pollutants. And on the other side, for some cases, like in our region, we had only three monitoring stations measuring NO2 and PM10, while only one measuring PM2.5 concentrations. And this is really a key point uh, for the accuracy of the adjustment procedure. So depending on the amount of data, the most accurate, the most data, the most accurate, accurate will be your um, procedure, adjustment procedure. And that said, um, maybe um, since in Clare City we have implemented a, an adjustment procedure based on the monitoring data, maybe it's time to start to look at uh, all these um, low-cost monitoring sensors and exploring this data also as a, an alternative to apply this kind of uh, procedures and for instance um, in the case of Bristol we have used um, for the NO2 concentrations we have used the monitoring data from the, um, the national air uh, monitoring network but also um, and also from the, the, the monitoring network but also a lot of data from passive uh, tubes measurements and I think that I have yeah, uh, yeah, I think you're you're exactly right in that you can you can you can also use proxies. I know here in the UK, for example, if we're looking at transport and we maybe only have measurements for NO2, but we're modelling for PM, that we can use the adjustments for NO2 as a proxy uh, for adjustments that we might put in place for PM. Uh, and also just to state that what we had throughout the um, the, the, the modeling chain was a, a kind of a verification step at each process. So we, ver we tried to look at a verification step in terms of our emissions. And then, as you showed, the uh, different components of uh, the modeling going forward. Um, and I suppose it goes back to my earlier point about um, assumptions and uncertainties and limitations and transparency and just being very transparent about what you have done and what you haven't done, what adjustments you put in place so that others can, can replicate what you're doing going forward. And so a final question for you, Vera, which is about the impact of high buildings on your modeling. Did we account for building height and did we account, I suppose this brings in the, the issue we've got around the street canyon effect that we see for air quality. Yeah. So how did we account for that in our models? Okay, so uh, since our domains were um, quite weak, let's say, um, we have used uh, an approach based on the, the roughness of the surface, more than considering these uh, high buildings and um, the street canyon effects. And we have uh, noted uh, this um, in our results, in our um, mainly when we look into the NO2 concentrations, we felt in some situations the lack of the street canyon effect. And one of the reasons we have applied this adjustment procedure was also to when we had an, enough data, enough monitoring data to try to overcome this um, limitation of our procedure. Yeah, I mean, it's something we did recognize, didn't we, that, that this tree canyon effect has a very, very localized influence on air quality, but because we were looking at a much broader region, um, we had to but it's uh, also, model accordingly. Yeah, yeah sorry, it's, also, it's also a choice. Uh, since you wanted to simulate these larger areas um, with a um, fine resolution, uh, you need to, to, to have this compromise. Otherwise, you will need to use a computational fluid dynamics model, which will force you to uh, go down in the size of your study area. It sounds like an idea for a follow-on project. Uh, okay, uh, we will uh, pause the question and answers there. Uh, as I mentioned, we will pick these up in an FAQ, which will be um, uh, put together over the coming week. Uh, although I've noticed Chris has been answering questions uh, as we went. 
Um, we'll create this FAQ and share it over the coming weeks. We'll also send out uh, the uh, uh, recording of this webinar for those that were on the call and also those that, that couldn't make it. Um, as I mentioned, we had a webinar last week which focused on the public engagement aspects and that can be found on our YouTube channel. Um, but if you also want to learn more about how we put people into the policy side of things and thinking about the earlier point about the assumptions we make, then please join our webinar next week on June the 25th, where we'll be focusing on the policy aspects of Clare City and how we um, got on with, with citizens as part of that process. We're also exploring, <coughs> excuse me, exploring um, follow-up smaller uh, webinars um, where we might focus in much, much more, much morely on some of the uh, community citizen engagement involvement uh, in the process. And again, keep an eye on Clare City on Eventbrite and you will find those. So keep an eye on your inbox. Uh, we'll be sending out all the resources in due course and uh, we'll be developing or announcing our e-learning resources, which will be coming in due course as well. So please keep an eye out for those. Uh, finally, uh, Clare City was, if you include putting the proposal together and kicking it all off, it actually ended up being almost a five and a half year project. Um, like all big projects, we've had some uh, we've had successes that have gone way beyond our expectations, and we've also had some challenges that have emerged and some questions that we still need to answer and still need to understand. But for now, I'd like to say a massive thank you to all of the project partners, those of us that have been with us from day one to now, and those that have come and gone a lifetime of the project, our 10 research partners, and indeed, most importantly, I think our six cities, because without their support, without their engagement, without their encouragement, without their challenging of our outputs and the results that we got, I don't think the quality of the project would be what it is. So for today, that's the end of the webinar. A big thank you to everyone for joining us today and a big thank you to our three speakers for taking through just some of the innovative aspects within the quantification work package, but indeed it's not the whole package. So if you want to learn more about our methodologies, these, as we mentioned, will become available on the Zenodo archive going forward. Final plug for the webinar next week on policy. Other than that, I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you very much.